the Commission. Uh, we have a rendering over there, which I can walk you through later, uh, which shows sort of the extent of the existing wetlands and how um, the existing building is situated and what our options are for uh, adding the fire station uh, on the site. And uh, we will continue to have a public process uh, in addition to regular updates to the Board of Selectmen and the public forum we had last night. We intend to have another one in July and um, as many other ones as, as we can. We've also been to the Design Review Board and we'll intend to keep them uh, in the loop on this project as well. So uh, before we get to your questions, I, I'd ask Chief Hart to come up and, and give a presentation about the fire station. And I'll have to warn you, the presentation has tr slide transitions. So I hope you enjoy it. Thank you, John. Good evening. Thanks for having me tonight. We'll just go a quick overview of of uh, the uh, the fire station uh, or the fire department as we as we have it today, maybe. Nothing. You'd be the slide guy. So just uh, <clears throat> the first slide, you know, North Acton Fire Station and how it's going to integrate into our current system. So currently we have three fire stations, uh, one, two, and three. We call uh, each, each station covers a district or, or a geographical area of town. So station one is kind of across the street here at 7 Concord Road. That covers uh, all of the proposed North Acton and the current uh, area around the center. Uh, school Street and South Acton, our District 2, covers the School Street and South Acton areas, including the Senior Center. Uh, station 3, our West Acton station, covers West Square, bordering Stowe and Boxborough. So all three of these stations were built with a village uh, need in mind. So we're continuing that theme with trying to incorporate a fourth district into the North Acton. So currently our staffing is myself, uh, the Deputy Chief Robert Vanderhoof. We have four shifts or four groups, and each group has a captain and a lieutenant, uh, 32 firefighters. Um, so the firefighters are, everybody's an EMT, and about 16 of them are paramedics as well, as we launched our ALS program uh, September of 2017 which is working out fabulously. We hired on an EMS coordinator along with that ALS program, and we have a fire administrative assistant. So next slide, please, John. Thank you. So fully staffed, uh, each group has the captain, lieutenant, eight firefighters. We do utilize one of the firefighters as a swing person. Uh, we call them a swing person. They fill in for the first authorized leave, the first uh, person out, so we run we run down to nine per shift. We got it working now? Beautiful. So this is our station one across the street. It ha like I said, it houses a lieutenant who's also an EMT. Uh, one of our lieutenants is a paramedic also. Uh, a firefighter, if we're running full runs on our engine and uh, with the lieutenant, and two firefighter paramedics on the ambulance. We also have uh, engine 21 is the primary engine out of that station. We have a second alarm engine, 26, the primary ambulance, rescue 33, a, a rescue boat for water rescues. Our car four is a, a vehicle that we use uh, when any of our cars are out for service or out of service for repair. We also tow the utility trailer and the boat with that, uh, which is the utility task vehicle, UTV, uh, which we recently purchased. Uh, it gets towed by that. Station two, which is down in South Acton, is just manned by two firefighter EMTs. It houses our ladder truck. This is the only station that our ladder truck will fit in at the time. Uh, the other stations are too small. Um, it houses engine 22, our backup ambulance, that should be rescue 34, and our fire alarm vehicle, which is a bucket truck, which takes care of our fire alarm system. It also houses a hazmat trailer and our safe educational trailer. So District 3 or Station 3 is located on Central Street. That houses our shift commander or our captain, they're one and the same. Two firefighter EMTs housing a primary engine, a second alarm engine, our brush truck. Car 3 is a reserve backup uh, command vehicle and a rescue boat. So 
admin office is in the PSF, the police station. That's uh, where my office, the deputy chief, our EMS coordinator, and the administrative assistant is. So our current deployment, we just kind of went through that. There's just a synopsis of our, really our four locations, our three uh, working stations and then administrative offices on one slide. Currently, these are our districts, a district map. Each district has a station in it. Uh, the district on the right, District 1, you can see the red dot represents where the station is located. So we have a lot of area to cover in District 1 with one station. The other two districts are reasonably sized and are well crossed. Uh, one can bleed into the other fairly simply. So we had a, a municipal resources do a management letter in uh, 2000. 16, uh, just to kind of review all of the past studies and some of their recommendations are really encouraging us to move forward with a station in North Acton. Uh, they agree that the 6668 Harris Street is the preferred location. They evaluated the 2A and 27 site that we had tried to do years past and felt that this was a better, more centrally located uh, location within that district. And then once that's built, their further recommendation is to give serious consideration to Station 1 across the street here to rehab that, to uh, make it a more modern station uh, to house the ladder truck in a central location as well. So how we're here today at this design and in, uh, in the design process for the new station was 2018 annual town meeting voted to fund this design cost. Uh, so that's where we're at today. We've drawn a, a redistrict line to break up our large District 1 into two districts, District 1 and District 4. Uh, and as you can see, it's a more manageable geographical area for a station to cover. Uh, so our proposed deployment with the fourth station is just really taking one of the crews that run out of Station 1 and moving them up to Station 4, and bringing our shift commander to Station 1 and our EMS coordinator to Station 1. So we'll, we'll basically have two people, two staff, working 24-7 at each of the four stations. So we are kind of advised by ISO, the insurance service office. Uh, they kind of set your homeowner's insurance rates and the NFPA, National Fire Protection Association. They serve as industry standards. Uh, so the ISO wants to have a fire engine within a mile and a half of everybody's home. You know, and further, they want a ladder truck within two and a half miles of everybody's home. Uh, the NFPA gives us guidelines for uh, arrival time or response time uh, for both fire and EMS. This slide just calls some of that out. Uh, we are outside of the recommendations without a fourth station, and we become compliant if we add the fourth station. So this is strictly a distance map of the current three stations. The inner circle is a mile and a half radius around each station, and the outer circle is the two and a half miles around each station. It just kind of gives a visual impact of how uh, North Acton just isn't covered according to these standards. And then this is with the same circles with the proposed North Acton station, it really brings the town into a better picture uh, to serve everybody appropriately. So some of our numbers, if you will, our last year we responded to 5,319 incidents over the four districts. <clears throat> We're going to break out the fourth district of the proposed fourth district, so we came up with 1,251 total incidents for this new uh, District 4, and 465 were what we consider emergent, either fire or EMS, so you know, a medical or some sort of fire-type uh, response, 
and then we have a fair amount of non-emergence, which generally are inspections or, or general service calls. So this is a fairly busy uh, district. Uh, it's a lot of commercial buildings in this area, a lot of apartment complexes, a lot, a lot of uh, need is in this area. So that pretty much wraps up, uh, you know, the overall assessment of the fire service right now as it stands and as we propose to uh, work in the future. So, questions? No, no, Tom. Chief, just a question on the uh, the map that showed the coverage, the radius. It looked like with the, the mile and a half radius, or the larger one, we were pretty well covered. But yeah. the tighter one, there were still some gaps, and yet we're in compliance. Yeah, there is. Uh, there it is. It's 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 one of those things you really can't uh, perfectly cover that. But uh, we're better off here than we would be without the station. Mike. Hi, Chief. Um, there's a number of questions. One is that uh, there's certainly a need for this fourth station in, in uh, North Acton. But just looking at the issue of the fire station requirements in general, it seems like every one of those stations needs some attention which sort of suggests a need for a longer term capital plan that addresses all of them. So one of the things, uh, sort of an indirect question to the new fire station, I was wondering, since uh, we're gonna be eventually working on all the stations, say one at a time, if maybe this North Acton station could be maybe overbuilt a little bit to a accommodate an extra fire engine or some equipment just at some time in the future when all those other stations are going some kind of doing going through uh, you know some kind of repair or upgrade or you know whatever um, I just think even though it might be oversized now it might uh, now's the time to do it since you know you haven't put a pencil to paper yet for design and uh, <clears throat> I just think it might be a good idea but also I, I think in the long run we also need to address this long term need for uh, of all the stations that need to be upgraded and improved that's a good point uh, Mike yes yeah, thank you I think um, to your one of your it's being designed for a 50 year to be a 50-year station to serve the needs of the community for 50 years. So even though the, the initial plan is to staff it with two, uh, it'll be built to uh, staff more than two people out of that station uh, as uh, staffing changes over the, in the future. And with regard to the other stations, uh, we, we will need to do a capital uh, planning uh, process to make sure that we understand when and how we will be um, handling the needs of the other three fire stations. So that's certainly something that we'll, we'll starting already and we'll, we'll continue to work on uh, as we have, the, the goal would be to have one modern station all set and then work from there to really lay out a, a plan to um, get the other three in a position that will best serve the community. I have a follow-up to that exact point. Uh, it's a corollary question. Uh, one of the original plans that was discussed uh, almost three years ago now was actually, uh, rather than having a fourth station, potentially having three new stations more strategically placed to fully, to get even better coverage map than what we have here, sort of not uh, not propagating the, uh, the, the logistics of the past. So my question is, is, my first question is, does this fourth station uh, preclude a rejiggering of only three of only three three stations, or does it complement this plan, or do you not have enough data at this time to answer that? that? That's a good question. I think that building three stations at one time would would certainly be a an ideal way to to uh, to handle uh, providing fire services. But I think 
the approach that we're taking is to put one in the north part of town in a place that we think is strategically located to serve a four station model and would would also potentially work in a different number of station models. Um, so we think this is a good site for, to serve both of those needs. So potentially only having three stations total in this 50 year plan might still indeed be the case. Uh, you're not, you're not, um, you're not locking into a four station plan at this time, correct? We, we are locking into a four station plan. This is the fourth station um, and we're building it as the fourth station. Uh, but as I mean, if you look at that map, the concentration of the other stations are, are more on the other side of town. So having one here, I think, would be is is a good place to have it, regardless of what we do in the future. Okay. Uh, if I may, I have another couple of questions. Um, um, the school district is expect has set a preliminary date pending on the board of selectmen's approval for a special town meeting of December tenth. Is this when you anticipate coming in front of the town and asking for full construction funding of this of this plan? Yes, we'll be prepared, uh, and we're planning for that to be the timeline uh, that we have for this project. The board will decide, um, I believe, next week uh, regarding the special town meeting, and then if, if the board wants to continue along this path, that will be the, the course of action we take. Thank you. Uh, when you go to the town for funding, uh, my understanding is that there's two main ways of doing uh, a long-term borrowing. One is a level level principle, and one is a decreasing principle. I'm, Brian, I've got my terms wrong. Have you uh, given any thought or determination to which path you wish to take? One is easier for financing, but one actually pays back faster and uh, has a has less principal has less uh, interest payment over time. Which which path have you uh, started to go down? Uh, that's something that we'll work with the finance team with, and we certainly would love to have your input, uh, the finance committee's input uh, on that question. Um, there are benefits to both. Uh, one is easier or, and more straightforward from a budgeting perspective, um, and there are long-term cost savings in the other. Um, and so I think you need to weigh um, those two things as we make a decision. That has not been decided yet. If I could put my thumb on the scale, saving the long-term cost savings is more important to the finance committee than the ease of finance, uh, ease of booking for Steve and Brian. Just putting my thumb on the scale. Not not necessarily ease, but um, consistency is, is a better way to. Put Fair it. enough. My, my my thumb stays on the scale, if I may. And then my last question: um, um, You had mentioned that uh, there are you you pointed out, and I think it's a very strong argument, Chief, that uh, we are not in compliance. Does this mean we have not been in compliance for years and years, or has there been a change? Was there enough of a change in population, or was there a change in the standards that made us significantly less compliant than we were 10, 20, 30 years ago? So it's been a gradual uh, increase. So as, as the population has grown up there, and slowly our run-ins have increased up there, we fall out of compliance, uh, barring the ISO circles. So, but as far as response time, We've been out of compliance for a couple of years now, so it hasn't been that long. But like I said, the more incidents, the more people up there, the more incidents we go to, the longer it takes to get to those incidents. It drops our overall average, which speaks to the NFPA compliant issue. So these are just standards. It's not like we're breaking the law. We're just Understood. questions. So. so to strengthen your argument when you go in front of the town, definitely point out exactly when it was that we crossed out of compliance. I think that will, will bolster your argument when you go to the town for money. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Those are all my questions. Uh -huh. Hi. I had a quick question. I'm sure the feasibility studies have been done in the past um, with the location of Harris Street. The street kind of curves on both ends. So I'm, I'm just uh, curious to know how, um, you know, a fire truck would operate in a street that is so narrow and curvy. So uh, if you can give me an explanation of how you're going to address that. Sure. So, uh, you know, Acton's full of streets that are narrow and difficult to navigate, and we're asked to, to bring our app apparatus on all these streets to protect the citizens. So just because we're housed there doesn't mean we're going to be really, you know, conducting emergency operations any more frequently on Harris Street than any other street. That being said, you know, we train our drivers, they are careful, and uh, we currently navigate that street 
as we will continue to do so uh, carefully. Beyond that, there's traffic studies going on as part of this design to evaluate sight lines, uh, street construction, intersection, so we're looking into all that. Steve? Yes, uh, Chief, so average, average run times are, are interesting for uh, calculations and statistics, but right now, what's the longest run time you have to uh, a residence in North Acton? So our longest is uh, right around 11 minutes. And the standard, if I recall, is six. Minutes. Six. And let's see what else I recall. A uh, fire doubles in size every minute. And I don't know how fast a person's brain <laughs> dies without oxygen, but 11 minutes is a long time. Yes, it is. Uh, so, um, this, to your point, Jason, we've known we had a problem for years. This is at least the third attempt to build the fire station in North Acton that I'm aware of, and I think there was one even before that. So it's, it's not a new problem. Um, but we are a lot closer than we've ever been before. Thanks. Chief, so I know you had slides up last night showing the property itself. Do you have those tonight? Are they here? We have it. Oh, you mean the, the, the photographs? Yeah, the photos that you had up last night. Uh, that, gives me, that gives me an opportunity to plug our website. Thank you very much, Roland. Uh, actonma.gov slash fire station. Fire station is all one word. Actonma.gov slash fire station. There's a photo gallery like the one you, you huh. mentioned. There's also other reports and information about the project. And we'll use that site to continue to be a resource for the public to see what's going on uh, with the project. Great, thank you. Um, Chief, there's a, I know there's a garage in the back that I believe is three bays currently. As part of this project, would that be torn down or would they still, or we used to be able to keep that to use that for storing the boats or whatever you need to, other equipment that you may use sporadically, things like that or other municipal uses? Well, the plan, we're planning to keep the, keep the garage intact. And that's going to be used for a municipal or for the fire or both or? Both, but probably mostly fire. Great. I had to guess. Thank you. You have another question, Jason? <laughs> yes, thank you. Sorry, sorry to uh, remember this after the fact. I apologize. I didn't go to last night's uh, forum. You may have already answered this. Uh, the initial funding or design funding was approved in 2018. Where do we stand on the design? Are we at 25%? Do we have early schematics? What's the... Uh, What's the, and do we have any early, the last number I heard was $10 million for this building. Is that still the operating number that you're using? Yes, we haven't, haven't developed a refined construction cost estimate at this point, and we're pre-25% uh, as well. We expect to present some um, concepts and sketches in July to the public at our next public meeting. In um, July with a December go date? Okay. We're... Uh, we're doing, uh, yes, it's, it's an accelerated, uh, in some senses, an accelerated design, but it's also a very thoughtful design, and uh, we, we look forward to your comments. Thank you very much. Sorry for the interruption. Um, just a friendly suggestion. Uh, there was a school building committee forum last night, and this came up suddenly on Thursday of last week. So both of them kind of clashed, and we had to decide, you know, kind of choose between the two things. I'm sure it's the same thing for all residents. So in future, if you can make sure that the two important things don't clash the forums. Thank you. Well, I appreciate it, but I would say that there are more than two important things going on in town. This is a very exciting place. There's a lot of activities. Every night there are meetings where you could come and get involved and learn about what's going on in town. We will continue to do our best to try not to have conflicts with big projects that are planned for the winter, and uh, that was unfortunate timing for yeah, last night, but we're glad that you're here tonight, and uh, hopefully you can come to the next one. Thank you, but I think this was uh, two big capital projects, so I think it's important not to have them on the same night. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Now we have our town manager back again to discuss the Veterans Affairs Intermunicipal Agreement with 
the lovely people of Boxborough. Thank you. Um, so uh, as many of you know, uh, I've been working with the town administrator in Boxborough, Ryan Ferrara, on a proposed plan to create a district for veteran services. Uh, we have uh, James McCray, who is an outstanding uh, veteran services officer. He was actually our employee of the year, uh, and he does a, an amazing job for our veterans, and he helps out in other communities. Um, as needed, and over the last few months, he's been helping out in Boxborough as they're in between um, veterans officers. And so I think the proposal that we have before you is to have a, a formal agreement with Boxborough for uh, a district to be formed where Jim would be the director, and we would provide um, up to four hours per week of services to Boxborough residents, Boxborough veterans, uh, to help them with the 115, uh, Chapter 115 claims, and also to help to uh, help them access federal benefits that are available through the VA. Uh, the veterans officer in Acton also plays a big role in ceremonies and um, flags and various other things not related to benefits. Uh, in this arrangement, uh, that Jim would not be doing any of that for Boxborough, he would just strictly be processing and helping um, veterans in that community access benefits that um, they are eligible for either through the state or through the federal programs. And since it's a new program, uh, we're proposing to structure it uh, in a way that it'll be reviewed after the first year. It is, it is a three-year agreement, but uh, we're proposing to review it after the first year to determine whether, um, the, whether there's any need to change it. For example, uh, it's structured financially and otherwise for four hours of service, but if we find midway through or at some point that he's really providing 12 hours or six hours, um, we would uh, discuss that. I would discuss that with um, Boxborough and we would make necessary adjustments. But we're comfortable that given the workload is next to uh, not nothing at this point, that providing for four hours uh, would be a good start uh, and would allow us to um, help veterans in a neighboring community and also help support um, our, our programs here. So I did distribute the program, I mean the draft intermunicipal agreement uh, before the weekend. Just to talk you through the process, um, the way it would work is each Communities Board of Selectmen would have to agree to the intermunicipal agreement, and then the state's um, Department of Veteran Services would have to agree, would have to um, approve the district being formed. And we've already had preliminary conversations with them that they would uh, be in favor of the program, and that approval would not be an issue for us. Um, so just to walk you through a few of the parts of the district. Um, he would, J James would still be an employee of Acton. He would not uh, have any relationship to Boxborough. It would almost be a contract for them, and they would just pay the town of Acton um, at a predetermined period of time for the amounts as specified in Exhibit B, which as the Finance Committee you may want to just skip to that. Um, so this number is based on the veteran services budget that's in the town meeting approved um, budget for FY20. And it basically accounts for 40 hours of veteran services time. And it's, it um, says that Boxborough would pay 10% of it, which is four hours. Um, and then, so that's how the staffing portion of it is um, accounted for, and then that same accounting is used 
for all the other line items in the veteran services budget. Uh, one part of the program that had some questions about uh, how we calculated the number is the fringe benefits. Um, that is basically a, a multiplier that we've added to the salary to account for all the overhead that goes into having an employee, health insurance, um, the building, the electricity, the utilities, all the things, a vehicle, all the things that happen that are related to providing the service. Uh, this would be accounting for that. And this is a number that uh, Boxborough uh, proposed and they're comfortable with. And also we have a reception um, service at 30 Sudbury, uh, staff that help greet people and answer the phone. And this is accounting for that we would be, they would be covering uh, one hour per week for that service, assuming that they would have one or two walk-ins a week and it would take about an hour of their time. And if that number needs to be adjusted, um, we certainly would look at that. So the total cost to Boxborough for joining the district would be around $15,000. John, I apologize if it's in here. I didn't get a chance to look at this previously, but will there be one facility that, that James will operate out of for both towns? Yes, he will, be lo he will be housed in 30 Sudbury, and he may do a ho home visit to a Boxborough veteran, but we're not planning to have him schedule office hours at this point. Uh, that may change, but that's not the, currently the plan. And I assume he'll maintain some type of log to track the hours spent on Boxborough yeah. residents? Yes, he, he will, absolutely. He already has. Uh, started developing how we may do that. Thanks. Alan. Hi. Um, uh, so I'm just curious to know, what would Boxborough do without this? Would they just not have any services at all? Well, uh, under, under uh, Mass General Law, communities of uh, greater than 12,000 residents are required to have a veterans officer, and Boxborough doesn't have 12,000. Mm -hmm. So the requirements that they have that position um, don't exist, so they may choose to pro provide the service in another way. Um, but I think they recognize that um, James is a real strong uh, advocate for veterans and that he would do a great job for their community as well as ours. So I think it's a good choice for the veterans out there that they want to work with Jim rather than not have one. Sure. Um, so I don't know exactly what they would do. Uh, no doubt this is a great service. I'm all for it. Um, and I, I have no problem with the recommended um, estimate of the budget. Um, I, I guess I'm, when I take a look at the, the census and the allocation of the population, um, you know, we're 80, just over 80 percent of the total population, but we're only anticipating 10 percent of James's time to be spent on Boxborough. Now, I know that the recorded number of veterans, according to, um, according to Boxborough, is, is maybe lower until James shakes some trees over there. But what happens when this all of a sudden escalates and it's dominating, you know, eight hours a week? It just it feels like 10% might be on the low end of what, what I would anticipate being, being uh, services provided. Just my opinion. Yeah, I mean the the ten percent was based on four hours. If if it takes eight hours, that's yeah. something that I w would not want to continue and want to address that. So is that something that they proposed the the ten percent or was that? Yeah, I think we, given that there's basically zero hours being provided now, right? And that if you work with one or two um, veterans, it'll take one to two hours for each one. You know, over. That's just for a week. I think over time, I think that's enough to provide services from a baseline. Mm -hmm. And we would, as that, as the workload increases, we would go and, and make adjustments to Exhibit B or Appendix B. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, Al makes a valid point about the. 10% being uh, 
sort of arbitrary. <clears throat> but since the, 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 the agreement will be reviewed every year, that, you know, we can make adjustments as needed. And, you know, I would like to say for the matter, <clears throat> for the record, that I started using Jim's uh, services as a, as a veteran. Um, I found them to be extremely efficient, very helpful, very uh, uh, concerned about, uh, you know, <clears throat> veterans' welfare, and, um, you know, I have a lot of confidence in him. And, and I did notice that he is, you know, a very busy man. He makes <clears throat> wise use of his time, so I'm sure if he thinks four hours is enough for Boxborough, probably four hours is enough for Boxborough. Thank you. Uh, I'm assuming the answer to this is yes, but uh, does the fringe benefit uh, calculation on 61.5% include OPEB? I think it. I think it adequately addresses OPEB. Uh, we haven't broken it down specifically, but for most employees, I think 50% covers most most of the benefits. I think this is more than that. Okay. Is Jim currently a 40-hour-a-week employee of Acton? He is not, no. How many hours a week is he an employee of Acton? He currently works 32, and we have some another uh, person that works. No, he currently works 34, and we have another person that works 6, and we're going to be shifting that a little bit and having Jim work 36 and that other person working a little bit less. Um, so he'll start working 38 hours. Okay. So a four hour four hours would be ten percent. And if he's so it's more than ten percent of his time. Ten percent of his salary time would be spent working on Boxborough. Correct? Um, if he's a thirty two or a thirty four hour. Well the but the budget in here is for um, the full amount, which accounts for forty hours of service. So even though he works thirty two I mean, 34, the other six are all in here. Um, so 40 hours will still be provided to the veterans program, and the Boxboro will still pay for 10% of it. Okay. And lastly, do you know if Boxboro will be eligible for any state aid or grants or other monies that they would not otherwise be eligible for, for not having a veterans, uh, veterans uh, advocate? And was, uh, was there the amount that they were able to, the amount that they are potentially able to, uh, to recoup, was that taken into account at all in the negotiations of what is an equitable, equitable um, agreement between the two towns? I'm not aware of any programs that this, having a veterans officer gives the community access to in terms of grants. Um, okay. And as I mentioned, the 12,000 person threshold there below. So um, I think this is, we're just providing services to the veterans. I don't think it gives the community, it's gonna cost the community more. Basically, um, even though the state reimburses for 75% of 115, chapter 115 benefits, uh, when someone like Jim comes in and starts uh, working with veterans, they will be asking the town to pay the benefits and then ask for the 75% reimbursement. So adding, adding these four hours is gonna increase Box World's cost more than and the four hours that they're paying for us. Okay, thank you. So John, when I was looking that over, I know, as you said, it's gonna be an hour of the secretarial time. How many hours does the receptionist work per, per week? Is she full time? Well, we have, we have quite a, a team that covers, but it basically there's 40 hours of coverage. Okay. Um, so, why wouldn't we be filling that position out too at 10% for four hours a week? Because we, uh, most, Jim does the primary connections himself and okay. there aren't too many walk-ins that come out of the blue um, to meet with him. Most people make an appointment um, or call him on the phone. Uh, so we thought it was appropriate to account for reception Mm -hmm. uh, but we didn't see it as this being a big drain on the reception desk. Uh, just more of a making sure we're covering every base. Okay, fair enough. 
Um, I would hope that you would look at the numbers with Jim on a quarterly basis. So if he says all of a sudden, hey, look, I'm this quarter, yeah, I spent four hours, but the next two quarters it jumped up to five or six a, month, a week or seven or eight or whatever, that would be more tracking that over the over the, the years that we're doing this. And yeah, I meet, I meet with him monthly, um, okay. and so we, we, that will be one of the things that we talk about. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to bring this back to the Board of Selectmen. Uh, I don't know if we'll do it next week or sometime before the end of the month with the goal of having it um, be in effect for July 1st. So I appreciate your, your feedback, feedback and questions. And um, I think it's a good, it's a good way to uh, help defray our costs. I think I think it will. I think it will. So thank you very much. You're welcome. So now the next one is that we have on the agenda is um, working with your office. All right, working big night for you. me. Hit, I know. So we'll get you all at once. Get it done at the same time. So I just wanted to um, take a minute to to reach out to all of you uh, while in the same room to let you know that uh, my office is a resource to to you to the finance committee to the members of the finance committee if there are things going on in town that you have questions about or uh, projects or financial questions or budget things, um, I encourage you to reach out to, to me or, or to my office. And I think the reason that I wanted to mention is that in scenarios where there are questions or concerns and um, the finance committee members contact staff um, and I don't, we don't know about it, um, it puts me in a position that I'm not as comfortable with because then I want to be responsive. I want staff to be responsive. Um, but if I don't know about it, then it's hard for me to hold people accountable for getting back to you with information in a timely way. So it's really just a way to streamline communication so that if, uh, if there's things going on, I, I'd encourage you to, to work through me and, and I can help uh, get answers and, and help um, if you have any thoughts or comments. Uh, we have a great group of staff and I think they're very responsive. I don't expect that, that there has been a problem, uh, but I, I want to make sure that I just make that offer to all of you to, to, work, to work through my office so that we can ensure that there won't be any issues. Thank you. Thanks. Do you have any questions for Mr. Andrew as we uh, move on? Great. Thanks, John. Page two of our back agenda this evening. Point of view drafting group. A bunch of you were on there, and um, you get last year's, we're going to look over last year's point of view and see where maybe if any committee members have any suggestions for this year's point of view. You, Jason, whoever wants to kind of lead this discussion on this one. Um, you pay the electric bill? Um, do you want to lead the discussion, Jason, or Christine, or? I'll do nope. it. No, I don't want to lead the discussion. I have Christine a suggestion. Will. I'll do it. I just didn't know it was coming. You could warn a girl. It doesn't, doesn't have my name anywhere on there. I do like the point of view. The screen doesn't like the point of view, though. No. Mr. Chairman, is, is Brian actually trying to do something? Is that okay? So. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Uh, Ross, no question. Chairman, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. How do you like that cover level cover sheet? All right, then. I, I mean, all right. Um, I assume that the, uh, the way we format this is fine, but if somebody wants to make an alteration, we can discuss it. Yeah. Well, just the format that you have there, that's really designed for a, a live um, broadcast. Correct. <clears throat> and, but your handouts should be... I think much more concise. Con more, you want a shorter handout? Yes. 
Do we want do we want a slide presentation, but a handout that's really more like a, a document rather than a presentation? Is that sort of what you're getting at? Well, I, I would like to see a, a document that probably has more, uh, I like a picture is worth a thousand words. Sure. So if you have more pictures, you need less words. So I think more, so you want more charts and graphs. More that, charts and graphs, the less. Charts and graphs tell the picture, can tell the story. All right. And for the most part. But less words. More pictures. I'll see what I can do. Can I, can I make a suggestion, Christine? Yeah. Um, adding on to what Mike said, um, last year when we reached out to the junior high and the high school PTSO, they did not have the time for the finance committee members to go in and give a presentation. They did ask for handouts. So this handout might not have told them the complete picture. So I think yeah. with explanations. So maybe I was thinking maybe we have like a few iterations of the presentation, the handouts, and for the PTSOs, something that they would be interested in, and um, for the rest of the town, a different kind of a presentation with... Sure. Okay. No, that's a great idea. All right. I don't think anything has changed as far as this slide goes. We'll have to update this one because uh, these numbers fluctuate a little bit year to year and we still struggle with. Yeah, uh, comparative data is also, I think, very valuable. Okay. Sometimes you don't know how you're doing unless you compare yourself to something else or someone else. Sure, so we have that in the appendix. Um, we have, I, I, I lied about that. We used to have that in, a, in the appendix and it was taken out of this past year's POV but we used to show Lexington and Concord and Littleton and Westford. Um, so we can definitely add that back in. Um, as an appendix? As an appendix, because I, I mean, if we want to try to work in comparative data onto one of these slides, is that what you're hoping for? Or is it okay to refer to it in the appendix? What was that? Do you, you want, do you want comparative data right on this slide, or is it okay if that information's available in the appendix? It could be in the appendix as okay. long as it's in the presentation somewhere. Okay. Probably in the back as a, you know. In, in, yeah, that's what yeah. I'm thinking. Okay. There's, there's one question that I've been getting recently, and it's like, well, how does our tax rate compare to Congress or to another town? Right. And I would like to see what our, have a chart of some sort. I don't know how you can put, you can kind of construct this, but it would be our tax rate is X per thousand. Right. Conference is X per thousand, whatever is X per thousand. And what's the mean home value of those other communities? Because obviously a, a, a house in, in Concord, the same square footage as one in Athens, is going to sell for more money. Right. But it's going to have a higher higher um, assessment. So you, you really, it's really hard to compare because, yeah, they may pay less per thousand, but their home value is higher. So their so their assessment is higher, mm -hmm. so they pay more okay. than what we do. And I think that's kind of um, if you could structure okay. like that, it might be tar hard to do that. But I, I well, is say, that captured by the average single family tax bill? Uh, maybe the average, yeah, maybe comparison to the average ta uh, family tax bill per per acting. Because we we definitely do not want to get caught up on the what the what the mill rate is. That's, that is absolutely yeah. a specious argument. So yeah, well, I, I think, I think some that shows that comparison and saying, hey, you're not taxed the highest in the land, but you're not, you know, it's. I think we need to talk yeah. about the tax burden versus the, the tax rate. Like you said, if, we, if someone in Acton is paying, or the typical house tax bill in Acton is 12 grand, and the typical <clears throat> tax bill in um, Concord is 20 grand, their burden still might be lower than theirs because, you know, their houses probably are worth twice as much as Ackman's. So That's why we had that slide that I know you hate, Christine, where we had, how that we had tax, tax rate, sorry, uh, tax burden, house values, and income. 
which I know is your least favorite slide. In Apples, all. oranges, and pears. Mm -hmm. Tell well, me more. Yeah, but no, well, it's it's comparing comparing one thing from a from a burden perspective and the other versus a value perspective. So what, so what we had in the past, and I just found the old one, for Acton Westford, Concord, Sudbury, Boxborough, and Littleton, is we had the average single family value, uh, home value, the uh, average single family tax bill, the average family income, and the tax bill as a percentage of income for, I mean, I had that data from 2010 to 2017, so I can update it with the most recent numbers. And it, I mean, it, it's a little busy, it was an appendix, but we can definitely include that again, if that's. That'd be good, and having it in an appendix is fine. Okay. Just, I, I, I just want to be able to say, we can somehow defend it. Yep. In a way saying, we have that data. Right, and I feel like when we discussed this uh, a couple years ago, that tax bill as a percentage of income was something that did apply across the board and go, mm -hmm. and, okay. Great, so I will uh, look at re-including that. Yeah, I'm just curious to know, is there a way to um, find the average assessed value as opposed to the average value? Because there, there's a disconnect sometimes between the assessment and the actual value. Yeah. So to, so to compare what the tax rate is relative to the value of something that's assessed differently. Right. Um, Brian, would different, you be able to comment on that? Different methods. So State Department of Revenue provides us a range for level of assessment, and I think that's where you're going, Al. So the town of Acton's at 95% of market value. So if you're looking at adjacent communities, you would have to understand whether at 95% of market value or 105, because it would have some impact on that average value. I'll see what I can do. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, a question on the footnotes. If I'm reading one and two right, is this really 2010 data? So some of this data is from the old census, yeah. which means these numbers are going to be really interesting in the next couple of years. Yes, but it's it's what we've got. It's what we've got, and when you dig and dig, there's just nothing else available. Whoa! So it'll be really interesting Bring to see where place. we are when the new census happens. Try not to ask Brian anything again. Right? Well, you, you, got, you got a lot of line right here. That <laughs> let Brian figure that out. Want to go to the next slide? Sure. All right. Uh, so this so this one will get updated again. And this is what we were talking about for the other towns: the uh, tax bur burden as percentage of income um, will really compare to Acton. Could you um, Would we be able to get an updated number there, you think? The oh, yeah, yes. Um, so not 2019, but I should be able to get to 2018. So our burden is going down. Yep. Yes, our burden has been going down. So I'm rich. You are. And, and uh, if you could just add the 2018 <coughs> under the 2016. Yes. Get a and in Concord, between 2000, what did that, 2000, between 2010 and 2016 in Concord, it went from 4.7% and six to 6.02% 6 as a percentage of income. So theirs went up, um, and uh, at Boxborough went down a little. So, but we. we oh, so it shows though. Even though our tax bill is going up, as our a burden is is not reducing. Yes. Oh, yes. Which is why I like that number. It's a good number. Because I think it's a useful number. Um, Mr. Chairman, do you intend to revisit our reserve policy, or is this? We'll, we'll we're going to talk about that again this year, as we do in the last several years, okay. and discuss where we were, what, what's where we're, where we're at now, and where we think we should be. Okay. Do we need to, yes. So, so I think two or three slides from, from here, um, or at least on the, when I gave the 
end of the, when I gave the town meeting, no, yeah, three slides from here, we still have a projected debt service slide. Maybe it's four, one more, two more. There you go. Uh, I think that is going to become a very important slide in this coming year. I think it's, we're going to be. You're skipping ahead. Okay. Please go back. I'm still in the state of the town. You've already moved to concerns. Uh. Um, I don't know that I would go into that state of the town because by the time uh, this one's going to be out in the public space, that we'll already be talking about that other one. That so three slides down. So you 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 kind of that's old news. So do we want to have dotted projections of the state of the town? On, on this slide so that we show what is and what we expect. I or, guess all I'm saying is I wouldn't go through three or four slides to get to that last one this sure. time around because it's, like I said, it's about the, talking about the state of the town debt retirement when we, mm -hmm. when we will be talking. I mean, if we're lucky we get this done in October and this is a town meeting in yep. December. So I'm wondering uh, if we so. want to... It's going to it's going to be accurate for about thirty days, and mm -hmm. that's not what we're trying to do with the point of view. Right. So, so if we kept this, but superimposed in a, 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 a you know, what what we're expecting it to look like. And you're going to have to include the fire station. And I'll have to include uh, so the fire why station. Why not remove it from here entirely and keep it where it is, three or four slides later? Yeah, I can. Yep. It was. Uh, it'll and then it would it would be re included the following year under the state of the town. Um, well, I, so I have a problem with that. This is the state of the town. Yes, it's going to change. I, I think I, I kind of like having it, but also showing where we think it's going to be. And I think we can do it on this one slide. Um, but uh, I can mock it up and you guys, we can, we can all talk about okay. it. Okay. Pretty good. All right, so then concerns. Um, this is always worth noting, we take in two and a half percent. Um, I don't know if we should maybe put some of unused levy capacity that we've been using in the last two years and looks like we'll be using this year with the, the remainder of it. Uh, I know, have... but it's so small this year because we've already burned through all of it anyway. <laughs> I, I know, it's still small, but it's still a, it's a small number, and, and B, it's a very difficult concept to explain to anybody that isn't intimately familiar with municipal finance. Um, so if, you, if you only want to talk to financial wonks, uh, sure. If you're talking to the general public, no. Okay. We could still speak to it when we present. Yeah, we, we spoke it to when we present, so maybe just leave it that way, I guess, Mike. Yeah, I'm assuming each one of these concerns, whatever they may be, that we also offer an action to right. counter those concerns. That makes sense. Um, so this will have to be updated because these are last year's numbers. Yeah, sure. Um, where it says past four years, competition growth exceeded 4%. It, are we able to see what the breakdown is, maybe, between the school and the town? We have the, we got those numbers last year. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe So, in theory, for the schools, they were sort of right-sizing their pay structure. Um, there had been some lean years, and so there was a contract that had some pretty big numbers, and hopefully that is not true going forward. But yeah, I, I think I can get that information. But the good thing was they were able to reduce their healthcare spend last year, so that. That was lucky. Not right, uh, offsetting. Right. That year.
I would recommend we put the projected debt slide as the first of the concerns so that it's immediately after the the decreasing debt slide. You just go fine, we go from state of the town <coughs> right into what is going to be probably the all consuming topic for this coming year, which is our first uh, capital override since I've been in town. For, and I think our first capital override in 19 years. So it's going to be between the school and the fire department. That's going to be the overarching thing that we're going to talk about for at least the first half of the year. I'm okay with that. And then, um, so this one would be in our state of our town yeah, with the new. Fire in there, estimated. Yep, with the new but numbers in included. So you, you, it's kind of hard to see what we're saying. How much is the school? How much is the fire? What? Now that we're a year past where this was and we're getting even better numbers, we can be more explicit as we, especially as by the time, by the time we ratify this in September or October, um, I would anticipate that the school building, I mean, they get their final numbers the last week of August. So we should have a much better grasp of what the school is going to be. Uh, I can't speak to the fire station at all. I'm shocked that they're not even at 25% yet and that they're expecting to have, you know, be going for numbers, going for bonding in December. I think they're, when he said they're on an accelerated schedule, I think that's by necessity. Question on this graph, it, it shows that in the year 2024, our annual debt service will be substantially higher than it's been historically. Mm -hmm. Do we have data that can show back far enough when, or had it ever been 8 million a year? So, I have tried to get that data, and I will. I'm I'm happy to go after it again, um, and if and I th I think that's a good thing to have. I would just, I would very much like to see a 2010 number and a 2000 number. Yeah, if we can't get every single year, let's get at least a couple of the nice round number years to to jog people's memories. Um, my advice to whoever it is who who goes after that, especially if it's me, is get started on that now because it was very hard to get those numbers. I'm looking at you, Brian, and Steve. Not you, Steve, the other Steve. <laughs> For the record, the school got me the numbers within 20 minutes. Not, you know, not saying anything. <laughs> Was that Bill? Dave? Dave right now. So. We had talked about going back and adjusting the prior debt service to kind of mimic that one, I think, and I'm wondering if that makes sense. I, I kind of like the, the existing state of the town to show the existing. The problem is by the, by the time we present this to some people, that will have changed, right? We will have voted an override in December, early December. So if we're showing this off mm. in January, that, that number is no longer valid. That's why I, I was wondering if we could show it in a dotted line, as in this right. is as opposed to that. Okay. This, right, instead of the two slides, but I'll get all this information. It will be clear what we came into the year with and what we expect to leave the year with. Is that that's what I'm hoping for? Okay. So this will have to be looked at and updated with whatever the current capital current planning is. So we'll know more about reserves soon. Uh, right? Brian, what's the earliest we're going to get uh, reserve numbers? If it happens June 30th, uh, do we have any hope of getting them by September 1st? That would be the target. Uh, we generally try to wrap up things in September for early submission, submission to the State Department of Revenue. So if you guys recall, at this past town meeting, we spent $1.7 million of reserves out of 2.6, which left a balance of 900. So State Department of Revenue will have us kind of 
pull that off to the side if you would. And then, of course, this year's replenishment at 630 will go right back to building those reserves. We currently have a plan in place uh, to try to build those back to at the same level that we were at last year. At least that's our target right now. So, you know, we're trying to watch spending. We're trying to make sure we have a soft landing at 630 and try to see if we can beat some of the revenue projections on the street to make that happen. One of the unknowns is what we call the statutory adjustments, which is the changes in liability from one year to the other, which would be when you run deficits on grants, um, State Department of Revenue will hit your free cash calculations. That changes year over year. So we're monitoring all that right now, but the, uh, the, the plan is to make sure that our reserve position is at the same level as last year, going into town meeting. So we'll have to have a discussion about what our concerns as far as reserves are going to be. So this slide, most of this will go away and we'll have to, no, based on what's coming ahead and what the reserve numbers end up being. And then this one will be updated. Do we want this to include 2010 or do we want to drop a number off and move forward with it? When we, yeah, when we can drop 2010 off. Okay. And recommendations. So we'll have a future discussion on if that is our continued reserve recommendation. I don't see any reason to change right now. I don't know if anybody else does. If anybody has anything yeah. on that. Steve? Um, I, want, I wanted to back up to concerns for a minute. Um, there is a concern as we talk about uh, the next few years that there will be a slowdown in economic activity, we call it a recession. Um, and when we talk about um, spending, holding down spending, oftentimes, um, since most of our um, spending it comes in the form of compensation, and compensation is often collectively bargained for a three-year period, there, there's a chance that we could get into a couple of expensive three-year contracts um, that will be going on as we um, hit um, a slowdown in the economy now. What happens to a town when you have a recession is kind of like a slow motion recession because assessments don't change that rapidly. I mean, it's, you know, housing values can fall, but assessments uh, don't uh, catch up for a while, uh, maybe as much as two years. Uh, and assessments are only how we divvy up the budget, not, they don't determine the budget. Uh, so um, I think what happened in 2008 was um, rev tax levy stayed pretty level through the, the worst of it. Um, tax rate jumped. Um, I think it jumped about four or five bucks over a few years. Um, and so, and then it impacts us um, going forward for several years. You, New growth kind of trickles down to almost nothing, um, and the tax levy grows somewhat slower um, because we we don't get that little boost we get every year when market values go up, and we reassess uh, houses that um, haven't pulled any permits. They're just worth more, and we don't we don't get we don't see that gain that happened that's been happening pretty regularly for the last. 10 years, so we get squeezed. Um, in, um, in 2008, you know, yeah, we, we, we had a, f a joint uh, school, town, FinCom, cost savings task force. Um, most of the uh, unions agreed to take at least one year of zero um, increases. Um, but like I said, it's it's very much a slow motion uh, recession. It's, it hits the town and it, it doesn't, 
it doesn't end when economic activity starts picking up again. It, it, it lingers. So somewhere in our concerns, we should probably try and say we may be facing uh, first economic bad times we've seen since 2008. So I think this is a great slide. I just like to keep it. So this one will be altered because that is happening and I think it should reflect that it's happening and we should ask them to continue to make it happen rather than as a please do it. Yeah, so for example, the school, the schools have that uh, the 13 year capital, capital improvement plan. Mm -hmm. I, I would still like the Board of Selectmen to, to provide us their 13 year plan or their true list of top 10 top 10 priorities because you know the Asa Hutchins house is on there we need to discuss that So this one's pretty much going to go because we'll already be done with it. Well, the don't add non reimbursable elements to design might be something we might want to. I don't know. When's that design going to be done, Jason? So we are going to be, we're supposed to be at 75% design with the reimbursement rate from the MSBA with a relatively strong confidence of what the final number will be on or around August 30th. Well, this month? August 30th right. of this year. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Great. Mm. This is just our long-standing position on reserves. Yep. Uh, so this one will have to be updated with any outstanding land purchases and what's happening on these properties. I don't know. We, we've run this one, this one for about three years now. It's been uniformly ignored. <laughs> well, <laughs> this means we have to be louder. <laughs> Walker is something's going on there now. So There's not a lot of money left to buy anything. Yeah, well, <laughs> the Walker, the Walker, we should be getting reimbursed from the uh, Acton Housing Authority for a million on that. Well, we still got burned on every one of those deals. Oh, yeah, yeah. So we'll have to do better when we buy the Kmart so parcel. hopefully right? it's a lesson learned. <laughs> Update the numbers, but. Yeah. Key conclusions. Uh, so not within the next three years. <laughs> the next year. <laughs> the next year. Next six months. And uh, are we still at risk for operating overrides? Roland, has the has ALG declared whether they're going to worry about an operating override this year or not? Or is, they, is, that, is, is it still too early in the session? Still too early because I haven't been to an ALG meeting yet. So fair enough. Christ, Christy went. Um, I'm not sure when the next one is. So. I think uh, that may be a, a, a more a, a topic of greater importance this year than in the last couple of years, because with a with a capital override clear and present, we need to address that early earlier this year than we've had in years past. The operating override. Yeah. If the 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 question about whether or not an operating override will be necessary. 
Roland, uh, I forgot yeah. one other impact of a re recession. Um, state aid can can um, level off or, or dry up because the state gets its um, revenue from sales taxes and income taxes, which are directly tied to economic activity. So you can you can lose a bit. It won't affect the town that heavily. We don't rely a lot on state aid, but the schools do. The, the one thing I'll say that from what I've been hearing is that we may have a rate cut this month by the feds, which if that does happen, we go to bond and we have a lower rate, will be beneficial for the town in that respect. If you're a saver, it doesn't help you out so well. So it's, it's safe to say that uh, at least from the school building committee perspective, we're definitely paying attention to what interest rates are doing uh, because while it, while it is not a good sign that rates are falling for, for, at re, for fear of a recession, being able to lock in a 30-year 30 30 uh, loan for the new school building at 2-2 is a whole lot better than at 4-0, which was what some of the earlier, uh, earliest estimates of what, the, of what the rate will be. Duly noted. Any other uh, observations or anything else you'd like to see included? Bueller? Bueller. Um, okay. Finance committee business. Do we have any minutes? Oh, look at that. Excellent. We will take a few moments to uh, review those before we vote. If I entertain a vote, motion. Brian, under um, your third quarter financial update, it says the town is on the right on track. So, so maybe the town is right on track? Okay.
Do I have a motion or Sana? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, can I make a motion to I make a motion to approve the minutes from May fourteenth as I'm ended. Second. Yes. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained? It's a good reason to abstain. I may bring you these printed on two sides so you don't use as much paper. The is on reports. I'll start with Steve Noon. Any updates? No updates. Health insurance trust meets next week. All right. Sahana. Jason. Mike. Well, we always have something. The Minuteman Building Committee will be hosting a tour of the Minuteman Regional High School uh, new construction tomorrow uh, at 4. Anyone that's interested here, and, and mostly for the town officials. Uh, so anyone that's not aware or is interested in seeing the building, uh, we'll be carpooling from Town Hall. <clears throat> uh, those of us that are driving from locally, we'll be, um, we'll be gathering downstairs about 315. Those <clears throat> that are driving directly, uh, you know, please be at the uh, old high school at 4 o'clock. Dr. <clears throat> Buquillen will meet us with a, uh, a couple of school buses to take us to the um, new uh, entrance to the new site, at, and that's where the air tour will begin. It should take about an hour, and a, a good time will be had by all. And I did post an agenda for that, so covered. So the school committee hasn't. Oh, just one. Could I get a head count of people that think they're going tomorrow? Christy's going as well. And Brian's gone. Okay. Yeah. Go um, I cannot. We have a league annual meeting. So sorry about that. Used. <laughs> that was just dispensation. Um, so I forgot to mention at the last meeting that the school committee uh, voted in new officers. So the new chair is Tessa McKinley. Uh, vice Chair from Acton is Diane Baum, and Vice Chair from Boxborough is Adam Klein. Um, but they're meeting Thursday. Uh, no report. Uh, the next CPC meeting is June 27th. Enjoy. Thank you. Al? Yeah, so I attended my first um, Board of Selectmen meeting this past uh, last week, Monday, um, a couple of topics came up. The Veteran Services District uh, Agreement came up. There's nothing there that wasn't discussed today. Um, the Regional Housing Services Office um, came in to talk about uh, an agreement amendment. Um, Salem Points, Burlington's going to be leaving. Lincoln's thinking of rejoining. Um, Acton's hours went up. Um, of usage from 320 to 470 hours over the past year as a result of the housing production plan. Um, that escalates Acton's pro rata share up to 15% um, from what was 11%. Um, I don't know if that is intended to stay that way, but, but that's, uh, that's the escalation uh, last year. Um, Peter Light came in and he discussed um, the, uh, the new capitalization, the new capital stabilization fund. Um, as it turns out, the, the fund actually didn't occur um, to exist until Boxborough Town Meeting um, uh, came and went, which was past mid-May. Um, and there was discussion around the timing of a $1 million transfer from EDF to the stabilization fund. Um, the school committee voted to transfer in fiscal year 2019 as opposed to uh, fiscal year 2020. Um, uh, Peter Light consulted with the Department of Revenue and they can do this unless the town votes to disapprove. Um, the Board of Selectmen voted to waive the right to uh, the town meeting. Um, the EDF rolls over on July 1st um, and if we wait until after July 1st, there's a potential, um, the potential exists to bump over the 5% cap um, I don't know if that's of concern to anyone, but I thought it, it sounded important enough to share. Um, there was discussion about the South Acton parking. 
Um, and uh, the town manager is still finalizing the report. Um, there's still discussion about how to best charge users. Existing users will be made aware that, um, that they can still use it until September, I think it was. Um, and there is debate over how to best optimize um, the parking, whether it's for acting citizens or to extend outward, uh, et cetera, and so that's still up for, for uh, discussion. There was also um, some discussion about a feasibility study um, to put in a parking deck. So I don't know if that's something that's gonna keep coming up, but that's something, uh, something that was mentioned. Mr. Benson, do you have anything you'd like to share with us this evening? I um, an email earlier this morning uh, over an exchange I had with um, a resident, Elizabeth Ashi, and we will be um, addressing at Monday night's uh, select board meeting um, the fact that um, Stop and Shop has decided to seek offers for the purchase of the, of the Kmart and Purcell. Anything else? Uh, I move to adjourn. Do I have a second? second? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Dave's both. We're adjourned.